Hello to you, our lovely patrons, and welcome to episode two in our new exclusive series that we're calling Prestigious Pints. In our series opener, we brought to you none other than agile legend Mike Cohn. And we haven't lowered the bar at all for episode two, because joining us in our virtual pub this episode is the product owner guy himself, Roman Pichler. Yes, indeed. Roman is someone that Paul and I have both been proud and happy to be able to call a friend over the last 15 years, as well as work with him. And we've been inspired by his work, as I'm sure most of you have as well. So it was great to welcome him in, and we had a chat about all sorts of different things, starting off with how we get empowerment and courage as a product owner, whether product owners should be invited to sprint retrospectives, and the fact that we probably can't rely on our users to innovate for us. Naturally, we look back over the last 20 years and what's changed, and a little bit forward as to what might be in the future. And Roman even gave us a bit of an insight into how he feels about being known as the product owner guy. Well, we hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Grab yourself a drink and settle into our virtual pub for episode two of Prestigious Pints with Roman Pickler. Cheers. Hey, all right. Hello, Roman. Hello. How are you? All right. How are you guys doing? Very good. Well, welcome to our virtual pub. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to nice to be in the virtual pub. <laughs> it, although it looks it looks like we're in three, we're going to treat it like we're in the same place, despite us having three different backgrounds behind us. But it's it makes as close to the pub as we're going to get. I think. Yeah. Right now. But imagine you got a three hundred and sixty camera, because we can't be sitting next to each other. So each each of us has got a different part of the pub behind us. It's, it's what it is. Yeah, well, that could, yeah, that could work in a big pub. Um, it's quite, a, quite a fancy pub. It's a pleasure to have you have you here, Roman. Um, have you you've, have you done a pubcast with us before? I don't think I have. So it's really uh, first time for me. Yeah. Well, well, welcome. All so, excited. <laughs> it's good to have you here. So, um, yeah, we're welcoming Roman for another one of our uh, prestigious pints episodes. Uh, especially for our patrons so this is a a very welcome guest and, and Roman goes way back with both Jeff and I in fact um back as far as the first time I met you Roman we were in the same room with Ken Schwaber teaching um quite scarily quite trying to teach a CSM together mm-hmm. um that was the goodness knows what year that was probably 2006 I'm gonna say would that be right I think so yeah yeah it probably was sort of May time or so yeah, and it was um, it was what was the name of the hotel in London? For some reason, I I came along and you were there. My head yeah, in, yeah. Right? You, you stuck in. your head in. You 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 yeah. You uh, you were underground somewhere. There was no windows. Is that right? I remember the it name was... of the hotel. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's the one. Um... It's near Holborn, isn't it? Yes, Holborn the, Grand, Grange the Holborn. Grand the Grange Holborn. That's it. What it was. Yeah, yeah. and there was about. It must have been about 70 students in his class, something, some, some obscene number of people that, that Ken was teaching. And then he'd just say, OK, Paul, away you go. <laughs> and just throw you in front of the uh, in front of the lions. But yeah, that's that's the first time we met, I think. That was a long time ago. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, cheers. Yeah, cheers. I've got a, have you got a drink there. I'll, um, I'll toast to you, to you, Roman. But I'm, I'm drinking <laughs> I'm drinking leftover Christmas cider. So that's, that's, that's what I've, I've got. I've Ooh, got fancy what, today. What have you got, Jeff? Beer with a with a with a wax top. Ooh. It's like a wine bottle size thing. It's called It's a Ripper. Which is a bit of a rip on an IPA. So does the a, does the special waxed top make a difference, or is that just for show? I think it's part part of the marketing. I'll tell you that. I think it was quite expensive. It's six point eight percent. Oh. It's a barrel, barrel aged beer or barrel cask beer or something. While Jeff's pouring that, I, my, our viewers will know that I just drink very sweet, very, uh, very samey cider. But yeah, I've got, I'm still drinking the the pink cider I've got left over from Christmas. Yeah, it's a wood aged IPA. Um, barrel aged beer. With the Big glass Cody. that came with, was that part of the uh, part of the parcel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part of the 
So Very nice. Drink, drink the beer with the from the glass. Fruity. Review it. Bit of pineapples. <laughs> you just pick it. You picked a random fruit, then, didn't you? Just to try and no, just, I read the just back try of the and bottle. sound like you knew what you were talking about. I read the back of the bottle. <laughs> Cheers, mate. It's been a while since we've seen you. Yeah, cheers, Roman. Nice to see you. What have you got a drink there, Roman? Are you joining us for a, for a drink? Or is it a, uh... He's the designated driver. Well, it's water. So. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Roman's driving us home. <laughs> <laughs> saves saves us the, ta the taxi money. That's not very nice of him. Just yeah, like... no problem, mate. I stopped drinking over three years ago. I'm drinking Did alcohol. Did you? Yeah, and I don't know. It just never really had the urge to go back or. I should put this differently. The trade-off for me between starting to drink again and just the impact that it, it has on me personally, it just doesn't feel doesn't feel worth it really. Mm -hmm. And now it's been such a long time that I, I don't really miss it anymore. I mean, first Christmas without uh, alcohol was a bit strange, you know, everybody else drinking, mm -hmm. but you know, you, you sort of get used to it. So. <laughs> and there's more alcohol-free beer now available. So I, I yeah, still drink alcohol-free beer. I, I enjoy that. And I had an alcohol-free wine over Christmas. And I was all right. <laughs> <laughs> the others do, you, are catching up. do you feel healthier, kind of, do you, the lifestyle's better, better off for, for not drinking? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, for me, it was a process. I, I started winding down my alcohol consumption sort of, you know, over the course of, I guess, a year, one and a half years or so. And it's sort of, in a way, fizzled out a little bit. But I just, I mean, you know, I, I try to limit having um, some wine or beer to uh, Fridays and then only to Saturdays. But still, I, 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 you know, typically wouldn't sleep that well. And then, you know, could feel it the next morning. And the less I drank, the more I would actually feel the impact of the alcohol. Mm. So in the end, I just decided to stop. And, and yeah, it's, it's sort of, you know, felt good. But the best thing for me is that I just have, in a way, Friday and Saturday evenings, um, I can fully utilize <laughs> <laughs> that is true whereas usually i'd have like half a bottle of nice wine and maybe a beer or, or two beers and you know then i'm you know a little bit you know happy <laughs> yeah 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 and you, your saturday mornings are yeah you can start at a reasonable time not not uh lot, lot, like me i think we had so we did a quiz uh, a zoom quiz with some of our friends and we haven't done it we they're not half as popular as they were this time last year zoom quizzes with our friends but we did want to we did we did want to celebrate the end of, of january that it was that was that was a highlight was we're going to send off january on, on a friday night but i only had maybe two or three drinks but i felt awful in the morning i, I think i'm losing my uh, my tolerance to it i must be but yeah i know what you mean it's um it is nice to wake up on a saturday or a friday oh sorry a sunday and not have a, a thick head i think you know just i don't want to sort of you know drag drag on and you know prolong this conversation but i mean for me certainly because you said um you know you mentioned um the you know sort of you know you notice that change there for you and for me certainly with you know aging and getting older yeah. my body just you know couldn't cope as well with alcohol i mean i used to drink quite a bit <laughs> when i was younger <laughs> and really really enjoyed it so you know that's certainly a bodily change for me yeah fair enough no fair fair pull fair call you mentioned that, I'm, so this is going to be my first attempt at trying to link what we're talking about to work-related stuff. So you mentioned that your first Christmas was a little bit weird when everyone else was drinking. I'm going to, I'm going to use the term peer pressure, although nobody was pressuring you in that situation, but perhaps an internal sense of peer pressure. Is there any kind of, have you ever come across any kind of peer pressure in the world of product owners? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you, you know, I think, I mean, product owners, like, like anybody, you know, is susceptible to, uh, I think, you know, we're susceptible to comparing ourselves with others. And I mean, we grow up in a, in a competitive environment and organizations are usually competitive, at least to a certain extent. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I've certainly heard product, product people compare the tools that they use and, you know, the knowledge they have, mm -hmm. and, you know the products that they've look, looked after and the companies they've worked for. So in that sense, and, 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 you know, pressure, I think product owners get quite a bit of pressure from stakeholders you know, sort of to get stuff done or take on certain features, put certain items on the product backlog. I think it can be quite competitive but in terms, certainly in my, um, my coaching and companies that I've seen, especially from a product owner point of view, in terms of uh, almost, I'll say bragging rights that between 
across the, the company that my products outselling or, or or pushing further more feature availability whatever it might be but certainly um, that kind of um, competitive I think that product owners are naturally well I think it's probably a good thing that they do feel a bit of a competitive nature would you would you think I was thinking of something else as well, actually, while you were talking there, in that I think product owners have got to be prepared to stand out from the crowd. I know a lot of successful products are kind of building on what's already there and making them better, but if you want to build something a little bit different, you can't be worried about what other people are doing. You've you just got to not copy their stuff, not worry about what features are there in other in competitors' products and just think, well, what, what do I want in my product? What are my users mm -hmm. Do you get that as well? So, I think it, it takes quite a bit of courage um, to do, in a way, your own thing. And, um, and you know, um, do something, try and do something that is, that is truly innovative, that is truly new. I think it's generally much easier if you do something um, similar to what's out there already, something similar to what the competitors are doing. Um, I think whenever we, we, we try and innovate, there's a risk of, of failure. There's a risk that things don't work out. And, you know, you know some people are more comfortable with uh, failure and um, some people are less. You know. You've got and to be think, a good product owner, right? You've got to be. Well, in theory, <laughs> you should be. But, you know, I mean, you know, I tend to say to, to to the product people that I work with, um, you know, something like a like a growth mindset is, is helpful in, um, you know, understanding that product management is a very um, diverse profession. There's so much to it. We can't be, we can't know everything, and in a, and you know, we only create value by offering something new. And if we do something new, then we're likely to make a mistake. We're likely to fail. It's something we have to get comfortable with, but. You know, personally, I can get qu quite frustrated when when things don't work out for me, and I can be very impatient with my own work. So, you know, it's not always easy, I think, to um, to cope with failure. It's not necessarily easy to um, to innovate, and I think that's on a personal level, and, and I think that has to do ultimately with how I view myself and the expectations I have uh, for myself as an individual. But then I, th I think ooh, uh, I nearly nearly knocked over my glass here, getting all excited, <laughs> <laughs> talking with my hands. <laughs> um, but then I think it's also the organizational context that people are in, right? Some organizations uh, are more open to innovation and change. But I mean, you know, reflecting on my own career, I've worked for large organizations where, you know, I was essentially told not to ask so many questions and just get on with the job. <laughs> Do as you're told. Come on. <laughs> and if that's the environment you're in, then it can be can be tough to to do something new and, you know, experiment and try things out and risk failure. Mm. I think I was talking to a company just this week um, and they were, I mean, I was talking to, to product owners within their company and they were, I mean, really switched on, really, really passionate about their product, really very um, and absolute experts on the domain, on the, on the user base, but they're very much um, held, I won't say held back, but they feel like they're, they are, there's a bit of a, a fight, a conflict between the, the company owners really so so but the, the, the company has, has delegated an area of responsibility to product owners within um, within the company but they still feel like the the, the exec level or the, the directors the owners of the company could still potentially overrule them which I and and, and very much very quite nervous about challenging that and presenting an argument against the directors of the company that, well, well, whatever they say, we've got to do it. And I felt quite sorry for, for these particular product owners because they clearly knew what was right and knew that maybe no was the right answer. But just, just quite paralyzed by not being able to challenge the very top of the company. Yeah, and I think empowerment generally is a, is a big deal for product people, for product owners. Um, and it's it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that you know, 
I think one of the reasons why Ken Schreiber chose to term product owner over product manager instead of product manager is to emphasize the level of authority and empowerment product people need, particularly in an agile context where you know, we, we value collaboration, that we want to pull in the stakeholders and development yeah. teams and maybe even have um, selected users and customers in sprint review meetings and uh, sort of a little crowd there, right? So, you know, there has to be one person who can then make a decision if no consensus can be achieved to, to keep the product m moving forward. But I think that message, message got lost in time and, uh, and often product owners, product people aren't adequately empowered. They don't really have the authority to make the necessary decisions and, and stand up to senior stakeholders, including, you know, the managing directors and, and say no and push back. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm not challenging you here, Roman, but I am challenging something because I think one of the biggest complaints that people have when they're talking to me is that my product owner is not empowered and equally my product owner is. Well, the product owners would say, I don't feel empowered. But when I speak to their bosses, they say, oh, why don't they just make decisions? Mm. You know, they, have the, they, they, they say they want autonomy, but they're not using it. And yeah, there is an element of perhaps those bosses aren't aware of how overly influential and, and undermining they are. But equally, I think there's an element of self-sabotage of the product owners who, when we talked about bravery, they don't actually want to risk. Mm. And so they'll hide behind supposed lack mm. of empowerment mm. so that they don't feel that failure mm. Do you see, have you seen that yeah oh no i mean you know that sort of resonates with me and i guess you know it takes two to tango as they say um, and it, it it sort of reminds me of a conversation i had with a product owner a little while back and she complained to me that her management um, that she felt her management didn't really allow her to take ownership of the product roadmap and make strategic product decisions. And that's a fairly common complaint I hear from, from product owners. And so, you know, we got talking and I said to her after a little while, well, have you created a product roadmap again? You you're comfortable to create a product roadmap now for your product and present it to your boss? And she looked at me and said like, no, why? So I said to her, well, you know, it's it's a tricky one. It's sort of a bit of a chicken and egg problem, it seems to me. It's kind of hard for your boss to trust you to take ownership, full ownership of your product if you may lack some strategic skills, product management skills. And at the same time, of course, I understand that you want the support from your boss, but maybe given the situation you're in, the best thing might be to try and you know look up, read up uh, on product roadmapping practices and create a roadmap and, and, and show it to your boss. And that way you're being proactive and you demonstrate that you know, you know your stuff, you have the skills and also, you know, you um, you really want to take full ownership of your product. Yeah. But I don't think that was necessarily what she wanted to hear. I think she wanted yeah. me, me to tell her that her boss would have to change. Yeah. <laughs> everyone, yeah, everyone, everyone always expects the other person to change yeah, yeah, and the yeah, other yeah, person yeah. to do it. Yeah, everyone wants I mean. to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, it's, um, it's been one of the, I would say that's probably been one of the hardest parts of my job over the last 15, 20 years is having to tell people the things that they don't want to hear. Mm. I think that's that's ultimately one of the one of the benefits or the or the, the reasons for taking an agile approach is that transparency, isn't it? It's that brutal transparency of well, let's just deal with reality. Maybe it's a message we we're going to have to suck it up, but better we know it now. Mm. Did you always? In a, because you, you've, you've crafted it. You are the, you are known as the product owner guy, right? That's <laughs> that's that's not a that, that won't come as a surprise to you. I'm, I'm sure. Is that something that you always wanted to go down that track? Is that was always an area of passion for you? I think it's been an area of interest for me for a long time. But um, there were several developments really that led me down that path. Um, one was. Um, starting up my own business and um, having to take care of the, the services and, and products and thinking about them more. So, you know, that sort of really um, kind of caused me to, to start practicing product management properly. Um, and then um, I started first working with uh, product managers back in 2001. And um, that was also in an agile context. and. Um, that that, first, that that collaboration wasn't necessarily um, fruitful in the sense that the product be became a success. It ultimately didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, it was it was very interesting because you know until then I had more of a of a development and uh, technology focus, and then you know uh, talking to um, uh, product people and working with. In, in, in fact, it was a, a small team of product managers for a brand new healthcare product. It was a very interesting experience and something that kind of kind of stuck with me. And then um, when I after, when I started my own business, I was more focused initially on. Um, uh, development processes and, and Scrum uh, and, and Agile uh, frameworks, but um, you know, partly due to the two factors that I just mentioned, that that interest and the necessity to learn more about and practice more product management within my own business, and then the development within that space, I felt that actually specializing myself and going for what was back then a niche, I, I, view, I, I viewed it as a niche market at least. Mm. So, you know, that product owner piece that might be might be a smart thing to do. We, we spoke to uh, Mike Cohn a few weeks back, Roman, and he was he talked quite, um, quite frankly about how his how he's changed and how his views on certain things, he would be a lot more strong on certain subjects now than he, than he was perhaps back 10 15 years ago mm. do you think has your perception of the product owner role changed since you since you've mentioned 2001 or that or that that 20 years ago do you think it's moved on since then oh yeah yeah i, I think so and you know um i think you know as, as as i change my my outlook on on things changes um but i also think that you know our understanding of um, you know, how agile practices, how agile concepts, techniques and practices can be applied has changed as, you know, I mean, I'm sure yours has changed and you know, I think as yeah. a community, uh, as a group of people, it has changed. Um, but yeah, so it has changed. <laughs> yeah, I think, one I think thing that right. stands out, you think is that you, you just think completely differently about now than you did 20 years ago. Yeah, I think, you know, sort of for me, a, a big area um, in the last few years, certainly, and, and that's sort of something that that you know is, is sort of I don't know if it's new, but I mean, when I first um, looked at product management and started working with product people, it was really all about uh, the the hard skills and in a way that the the core practices and initially also more you know tactical practices and development related practices. I remember um, literally nearly twenty years ago sitting down with um, one of the lead the, the lead product manager and um, looking through use cases, you know, piles of use cases that she'd written and talking to her about the, the need to prioritize them so that, you know, we could run some iterations. Um, and, um, and and so, you know, I, I initially I focused a lot on, on, on these um, hard skills, um, but I think over the years I learned that while the hard skills are important and, and that expertise is extremely valuable for product people without a doubt the, the people skills the soft skills are, are, are just as important and I mean you know Jeff I mean that's an area you've you, you've worked on as well right mm, definitely yeah so that's a trend I think I'd I've seen in more recent product owner training and coaching is that the area of agile change agency or kind of it used to be back in the day yeah but in the back in very much a scrum masters remit and i think whilst that hasn't changed but i think a lot of product owners that i speak to now are becoming a lot more agile aware rather than something that's being inflicted on them it's now something that they're intrinsically part of so i think the question always comes up in my classes about um who is the, who is an agile change agent within a scrum team and I think more people now are more willing to listen and to respond as product owners because product owners can have a huge amount of influence on the agility of a company. It shouldn't just always come from the Scrum Masters remit, in my opinion, certainly. I got, um, I mean, the word for me over the last 20 years from a product owner space is the word empathy. That's, that's what stands out for me. Now, when... Empathy for who? For the product well, owner or for the... For well, this you? is where I'm going with it. Okay. I think historically... If you go back to 2001, the empathy needed to be developed from the product owner for the development team and from the development team for the users. I think yeah. those were the two glaring um, sort of gaps, if you like. The product owner was, was traditionally very hard-nosed, as I saw it, business-focused, profit-focused, return-focused, market-focused, very, in many ways, rightly so. 
and the development team was seen as a cost to try and achieve that as quickly as possible. Uh, and that, that awareness of actually engaging the team and their creativity and iterating and collaborating, that, that developed a great sense of empathy. And I think that had a massive success. But then where I think it shifted is actually, and I'll, I'll say this with a, a flippancy, but there's a, there's a seriousness beneath it, is that there's been a, become an appreciation from the development teams that I work with that their product owners are actually human beings. And so an empathy that the product owner has a ridiculously difficult job and that shift there, coupled with actually product owners have developed a greater sense of empathy for themselves because they realize that they are humans themselves. And actually they don't have to be the hard-nosed robot looking for you know, profit all the time at, 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 at any cost. That sense of, well, let's, let's take our time, let's have a think, let's, let's work with people, let's, let's show some vulnerability, let's, let's ask the questions, let's not think that we have to have all the answers let's test things that are, that are imperfect um, and that sense that's that for me has been the biggest shift that I've seen over the last 20 years tumbleweed <laughs> cheers <laughs> no I um, I would say I was going to say something else there uh, about this is the perception as well I think that has changed over the years with the one that always comes up for me is retrospectives hmm and then I, I always ask the question, who should attend a retrospective? And there's this, um, the, someone will always say, well, should the product owner attend the retrospective? And I think that's, yeah, that's something that has changed quite a lot over the years is that whilst it was, and some, some teams will, companies will still say, oh no, don't invite the product, Ooh, don't, yeah, definitely not. Ooh. We wouldn't want to air our dirty laundry with the product owner. But I, th I see it more and more now that it's, it's just, they're part of that team, they're part of that, they need to, hear these um, these things as, as, as much as if not more than the, than the development team themselves so I think that's changed over time as well the retrospect has become a much more inclusive event for those people as well do you encourage product owners to go to retros I do yes yeah and I like to ask when I run a, a product owner workshop uh, who attends the retrospective and ask those individuals who don't attend why not and when yeah. people say like oh my development team doesn't really want me to be there i say like oh how interesting uh, <laughs> maybe that's what you should talk about in the very next retrospective because it seems that you know the the collaboration and the connection with the development team members isn't quite as good as it could and maybe should be and might be might be even a trust issue you can guarantee they're probably whinging about you and that that person in that in that retro as well so it's kind of a, a, a whinge if whinge fest but yeah i think it's um I think it's a, a strong sign if that theme is, if that product owner feels is you know the first person sat down at that meeting rather than the, the last person to be invited. It is it is it is tough though for for product owners, you know, and sort of striking that balance between building a close and trustful connection with the development team members, but at the same time also engaging with the the stakeholders, the key stakeholders, and um, you know, um, keeping an eye on the market and. Um, talking to users, um, maybe maybe observing users using the products. Um, so, you know, combining that that inward and outward perspective and, you know, with, with regards to the inward work, um, the, the work inside the business, you know, attending not only to the development team, but also sufficiently to the stakeholders. So, you know, um, so, you know, I can, can, you know, it's because, you know, I'm saying this because sometimes, uh, you know, when I suggest to product owners to attend the retrospective, you know, they look at me, roll their eyes and say like, oh, yet another meeting I've got to go to now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. Have, but, have you but, seen, but, but, hmm? sorry, uh, just the, the, have, have things changed over the last year? So obviously it, it's impossible to have one of these podcasts now or have a conversation with anybody without talking about the pandemic. But have you seen product owners pivot their, their techniques? So having the customer observation you said there, just observing your customers, it's, it's, you can't do it as much, certainly as easily as you could. You can't get your focus groups as easy as you could. How have you seen product owners pivot to this new way of working? Well, I think, I don't know. <laughs> so there's obviously only so much uh, experience and, and insight I, I, I have, and it's, it's, it's quite limited in a way, but you know, I think there's been a massive shift anyway in the last five to 10 years uh, away from qualitative to quantitative, ultimately market and user research and um, more and more product people using more and more powerful analytics tools. And, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, I think, 
interviews and observations and, and even things like, um, you know, I remember reading in the Harvard Business Review uh, way back a story about, I think it was researchers at Lego moving in for a few months with um, families in, in the US, uh, Japan and, and Europe, sort of the main target markets back then to understand better how the kids would play and not only with Lego, but generally. Yeah. Um, and so that sort of really intimate level of research and that real immersion into your, your target audience, I think that in a way has been replaced to a certain extent with um, using analytics tools for various reasons. One is because it's easier and it's, uh, it's quicker and it's way cheaper. And it's less, um, it's less subjective in a way, isn't it? So it can be, yes, it, it can be. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we certainly generate way more data. We just then have to be careful not to be too biased when we look at the data and interpret it. But I mean, so, so, and I think for many product people, you know, that's just literally continued. And I do think that, you know, we can still interview use prospective users or existing users and customers through what we're doing right now, right? A Zoom uh, call, a Zoom session, and, you know, you can still observe by asking people to share their screen and see how they would interact with the app um, or hold up their phone if it's deployed on, on a handheld device. Um, but I mean, for me, as, 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 as valuable as it is to use analytics tools, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I use analytics tool in my own work, as I'm sure you guys do, um, I, I always feel that, you know, if, if there's, if the qualitative element is missing, then it's kind of hard to empathize going back mm. to what you said earlier, Jeff, I, I can't empathize with data. Mm. I can only empathize with human beings. So for me, it is important to make an effort to still occasionally, um, you know, I like to suggest once a month as a rule of thumb, meet selected users and customers and, and at least talk to them. Um, so to, to, to really understand what's happening for them. And, um, and I think that then helps me make better decisions uh, as the person in charge of the product, rather than just r relying on uh, anonymized data. Yeah, yeah. Well, you maybe that's quite an old school perspective. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> no, it's one of those things where I think the pendulum's kind of swung one way. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, we started out with lots of qualitative uh, yeah. and, you know, quite time uh, intense research. And it's kind of swung, I think, nearly a little bit too far towards let's use this analytics tool and more data, more data, more data. Did you ever watch that? Um, this is, bear with me on this one. Did you ever watch that um, TV show House with Hugh Laurie as the doctor? Yeah, the med medical thing. No, what's that? I'd, re I'd recommend it. It's one of my favourite things ever, ever, ever. It's absolutely fantastic. So I wouldn't put any spoilers out there, but basically he's, uh, Hugh Laurie is an incredibly intelligent, talented doctor, but he's a bit of a dick. And he doesn't, he, he basically doesn't have a lot of time for human beings. Um, and he th his, one of his premises, people always lie people always lie. So trying to get a diagnosis from a patient is pointless because they will never tell you the truth. Um, often because of embarrassment or whatever. And users and often don't tell the truth. Not consciously, but they, they will tell people what they think they want to hear in a way. Uh, and also what they would like to believe about themselves. Um, and so actually what people say they do and what they actually do can be two very different things. Is this linked to the story about the Walkman? Yeah, definitely. Go on, tell, you have to tell that because that's a good one. Well, I always get it wrong, but <laughs> the essence of it is, it, I, I can get, did, did some, Sony did some, you know, I'm, I'm not talking to you, Roman, because you know what I'm, what I'm going to say, but the, um, the, the, re, the research on the colour of the Walkman, the boombox or whatever it was, um, and people say, yeah, yeah, we, we love yellow. Yellow's great. Red's great. Yeah. Um, oh, thanks for your re thanks for your input, custom focus group. Please take a, a Walkman of your choice on the way out. And everybody took black. <laughs> and that what you say you're going to do and what you actually do can be two very different things. And as a product, you've got to be really careful of that, right? Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. And I don't think we, we should expect that users and customers innovate for us and tell us what our product should do, what it should look like. Um, the same is true for the stakeholders. I don't expect that stakeholders tell product people what their product should do or look like. I think that's really the job of the product owner together with the development team to figure that out. Um, at the same token, when we look at a process like Scrum, then um, 
I always like to think the product owner and the team should be empowered to take the first step and you know build a product increment, but then we validate the decision, we validate the product decisions essentially that we've taken by putting it in front of the stakeholders and selected users and customers and carefully listening to what they have to say. And then we think about it, we analyze their feedback, we analyze any, any data that we've gathered, and that hopefully will help us to make the right decisions and uh, adjust essentially the product backlog and therefore then drive um, the next product increment. And so, of course, we can say, oh, yeah, it's not a big deal. I mean, we just release uh, product increments on a regular basis, and so we collect the data, and that's cool. But, you know, the, the drawback with quantitative um, approaches is that it's very difficult to find out why somebody did or didn't do something. So the intention, the motivation, the underlying need is kind of hard to uncover. I think that's where at least selected qualitative um, measures come in. So I, I always like to think you know, quantitative and qualitative um, approaches shouldn't compete, but they should complement each other. And it'd be kind of nice to mix and match. And, you know, maybe the standard uh, way that somebody operates a team, a product owner uh, uses is to uh, release um, product increments uh, early and frequently. That's cool. But maybe then once in a while, every two months, every three months, you still do some direct observations. You still do some usability testing. You still do some interviews. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and it's always every product you're going to you're going to need a different balance and even for a particular product the, the state that product is in in its mm -hmm. maturity and life cycle your, your balance is going to be different between quality mm -hmm. and quantitative so it's it's i think a lot of product owners that i work with they find that really difficult the fact that they can't just <laughs> follow a blueprint if you like they, they they can't there's no right answer that they mm -hmm. can actually calculate and then check at the back of the book you know um and so I get this, this brings us all the way back to that sense of being comfortable with failure, if you like. So, mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll, I'll tweak the wording slightly and saying just be comfortable with imperfection because you'll never have perfection as a product owner. You just can't get that. Um, and if you're aiming for it, that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as it's, it's a healthy ambition. Um, but it's, it's potentially quite damaging if, if you're hoping for it and you know you can't get it. Yeah, that's right. Um, that, that's absolutely right. Um, there's there's no blueprint. I mean, the the, the, the techniques that, that, that you know people can use, but it's um, it's it's you know I sometimes think a product owner, a good product owner, is somebody who is a, has a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. um, you know, and is is in that sense then willing to take informed risks and um, stick her or he, her or his head out a little bit. Um, still may not be nice then you know to, to sort of experience some form of uh, failure or, or, or setback but but again that's that'll be part of that process but really sort of that sort of you know the wish the the, the motivation just to to move things forward and maybe bring about some change and you know do something different there's a lot to be said isn't there for um for almost and this comes a little bit back for me to the, the kind of the ceo kind of um stakeholder here is that I can think of one company where the CEO is quite resolute on the fact that no, they, the, our users don't know what they need yet. You have to trust me. You kind of, we should go, we should gamble on this, and we should kind of, we should, we should, we should, we should back that horse. We should go with that because they, those users don't really, they they're going to love it when they see it, and they just don't know they want. And it's balancing that. What what's our data telling us compared to what is our data not telling us mm. it's it's the gaps it's the stuff that we're not testing for yet it's the stuff that people don't even know that they need that feature yet and that's i think where that that sense of gambling as a well, i'm not owner. saying that that guy's wrong right because quite often those those ceos are, are they're right they're, but you need i think you need that 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 element of risk taking jeff well, the, uh, that, yeah, that ceo that's being awkward you do but there is a good way to take risks and what often happens in those situations is that person is letting that they're not crafting a scientific experiment they're crafting an experiment to prove themselves right and their confirmation bias will see that and okay maybe it's at some point the money will run out people won't buy it but it's too late now they, mm. those people need to be humble enough to be able to say okay i've got this hypothesis but i don't know if it's right yet i want to find out rather than I know this is right, 
I'm going to keep going until everybody out there proves me right by buying this goddamn thing. I wonder if it's about more of having a, a sandbox to play in, about about having a um, something, a continuous experiment to run that, that then it's not all riding on one decision that we've got m multiple decisions like this you know, being played around with all the time that it gives almost giving that CEO that that license to you know if you want to play with your toys go and play <laughs> go and play with this team can, can build some toys for you and then see if anything sticks to the wall rather than it's distracting take the distraction away from a product that's trying to grow and whether it needs to be something separate anyway I don't know I don't know what the answer is. There's a, there's a big balance, isn't there, between having... Because a product owner does need confidence. They do need to, to have a point of view and, and, and give it a go and stick with it in the early days because you know, experiments take time to, to come up, products take time to, to, to land and grow, um, but equally knowing when to, when to walk away. You mentioned, Jeff, that, that um, empathy, you're trying to build empathy. And I think the level of empathy between development teams and product owners has grown. I would agree with that. But I, I think there's still a lot of development teams that I speak to, that I coach, that want a sense of certainty from a product owner. They want a product owner to be able to stand up in a planning session and say, we're going to, this is the right thing to do now. And trust and, and I want you to go with me on this. So I think whether if that's a... a um, a facade that the, the, the product owner has to wear, um, even if they don't know it. But I think I think the team does still need some sense of um, authority around that and, and direction. Certainly, I think you know what I hear you say, Paul, is really that you know product owners should should offer some leadership uh, in the product space, and I would certainly agree with that. Um, um, you know, I do think it's important that product owners have an opinion about where to take their product. And I do think it's important that product owners articulate this opinion to the development team and to the stakeholders. But I also believe that it's equally important to, uh, you know, take take the opinions, hold the opinions lightly and and not forget to cultivate an open mind. So it's, it's sort of that balance, right, between yeah. I you know, ideally, as the product owner, I understand the market, I understand the users and customers, I understand the competition, I understand trends and dynamics in the market, and I've got an opinion and I've got a, you know, I've got an idea, I've got maybe even a strong idea and vision of where I want to take my product. But then, you know, I might be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think... <laughs> and I'm willing to admit that and I'm willing to be vulnerable in that sense. And I'm, yeah. I'm willing to listen and, and, and humble enough to listen to the development team, listen to the, the stakeholders, and particularly listen to the users and customers and you know try and look at any data and any feedback that comes in um, as objectively as I possibly can and I, I try and be aware of my attachments my biases yeah uh, we, we know what, how, how this how this works right I mean the longer we work on our products um, the more energy and time we've invested in it the more it tends to be our baby and the more yeah. we tend to be attached to it and the less open we tend to be to negative critical feedback yeah what's your, i'm interested Roman. what's because this comes up in courses as well that i teach product owners so we talk about stakeholder management and we talk about trying to kind of classify and, and categorize stakeholders what's your view on the scrum development team as a as a stakeholder should well firstly should do you think they should be a stakeholder in product backlog decision making um is that a risk is that a, a benefit is it what, what's your view on that so when, when when i use the term stakeholder uh, i always tend to think of the, the the internal business stakeholder so for commercial revenue generating product that'd be somebody from marketing sales support maybe finance operations yeah for those guys sorry marketeer sales rep i always look at the development team more as a for whatever reason as as a separate so you typically don't subsume or, or classify the development team as a stakeholder, but more as, I guess, um, I don't know, a partner, even though so I'd, I'd also argue that ideally um, the, the stakeholders that I mentioned, a marketeer and a sales rep should also become at least over time a partner and as a product owner. I'd, ideally, I'd like to establish effective and trustful um, working relationships with those individuals. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm wondering if, if development teams should have a say 
in, oh, yes, backlog. Uh, in, in terms of backlog prioritization because I, th I think they do they have they certainly have opinions in my in my experience yeah i think so i mean i i think i think it's i think it's good practice really to work on the product backlog uh together so product owner and development team and i think there's a mutual benefit here the benefit for the product owner is um, to leverage the knowledge and expertise of the development team and understand you know where technical risks often as the person in charge of the product that's not something that i fully understand that i'm fully aware of um, and uh, by um, doing prioritization together by maybe refining product backlog items together working on the product backlog together um, I ensure that there's a shared understanding, that people understand what those items, what those stories mean. Um, mm. and, um, and by inviting people to make product decisions, I usually increase the chances that people support those decisions, that people buy into those decisions. Yeah. And the benefit from a development team perspective is that, um, you know, as developers, we can be more proactive and we can influence and we can contribute to decisions and we can shape the product. And we also learn more about the product and, you know, we're not solely dependent on the product owner all the time. Yeah. Over time, we may be able to answer, you know, some of the questions that we have uh, amongst ourselves because we just pick up a, um, appropriate domain and, and market and, and product knowledge. I've seen it massively. Um... Um, I wouldn't say transform, but in terms of uh, m morale and motivation, I think there is a, if you want, like you said, the words buy in there. And I think um, teams feeling part of that, that decision making process, or at least understanding the decision making process. There's a lot of teams that um, unfortunately for them work on a very boring product, which actually generates their company quite a lot of revenue. So it's like, yeah, it's not great, and we're not working on the sexiest um, functionality at the moment. But we've this is kind of the stuff that's keeping our company afloat. So we understand, but we understand its part in that process. And it, they, developers may not get what they want all the time, but I think certainly involving them. And I used to work in, in Nokia Music, where I'd say seventy to eighty percent of the development team members were all musicians. So they had a real passion in developing a music product. So why why is, I used to ask the question why wouldn't why would we ignore that 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 feedback and, and ignore those opinions we can't may not take them all into account all the time mm. but you certainly want to have that voice heard as a as a recognised uh, voice. Roman, I, <coughs> we um, this is sort of stepping outside of the podcast a little bit and just going back to the three of us, but normally at the start, we would say something like, we, we just talk and see where it goes. And if anything you say, you don't want in the final cut, we cut it out. Um, <laughs> has, at what point did you realize that you, you'd become the product owner guy? I don't know if I'm the product owner guy. Um, you are, that, you are, you're the product <laughs> owner guy. <laughs> Everyone says to me, right, we need some stuff on product owners. Uh, we're, I'm going to Roman. Go and read this book. Go and read, go and read this book. You're the product, product owner guy. And, and it's very humble of you to say so. You know, I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, the... Do you enjoy it? I mean, let me ask you a different question. Here. Do you enjoy being the product owner guy? So... I mean, it's kind of nice. Um, what is really nice is to see when people recognize the work and the efforts that, that I do. I mean, that, that is that is generally very rewarding and I think it's rewarding for, for anybody. Um, it's also rewarding when people recognize my, uh, not only recognize, but recommend my work. And, and um, yeah, that's great. But I, I try, I honestly try not to get too, um, to attach to a specific view of, what I've achieved or who I am um, because you know things things change and um, as much as I enjoy what I do and I, I generally enjoy my job I really do um, and I'm, I'm grateful that I have the job that I have I know at, at some point in time it's it's going to stop it's going to end so you know um, yeah so you know I don't want to certainly think of myself as the, the 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 mega product owner guru and if people feel I've got something helpful to say that's great but I mean the, the other people obviously out there including you two gentlemen you know that have very valuable um, uh, you know things to say and very valuable advice too so do you feel the pressure of people maybe taking uh, too much 
or reading too much authority into what you say. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, oh, I, I do. Yeah, and you know, it's certainly it's certainly the case that I've sort of become a little bit more careful over the years, and I think I choose, I try and choose. <laughs> I'm not sure that it always always succeed, but I try and choose my words a little bit more carefully. Um, you, you know, certainly, you know, when I when I write stuff, um, and I, I have to say that, you know, I. I, I did think quite a bit about my, my, my last book and um, I, you know, you know, in the process of preparing to write it and then during writing it, I, I, I sort of thought, you know, that I, in a way I have a responsibility because, you know, people may take notice and they mm. may, well, you know, and so I wanted to make sure that it's a, a decent book. But it's also about something that I really care about, and I, I think that would be valuable for the individuals, the individual readers, but also for the whole product management community. Mm. Um, you know, when you would have done that when you were working at Siemens, I, know, I remember, I remember having a drink with you a while ago, and you, well, it's probably ten years ago or something, and you're saying how frustrating it is when you hear people say, "But Ken Schwaber says," like it's like it's an argument that should be listened to, you know, and he's just a human being. Um, and, and over the last 10 years or so, people have been saying, but Roman Pickler says, mm. um, and a lot of it is absolute gold, right? But you and I will spout a bit of nonsense now and again, or mm. people will uh, will interpret what we've said in a different way, right? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. None, none of us is perfect. And none of us is always right. I mean, you know, we're all human beings and we all make mistakes. It's, it's natural. And so I, I always uh, hope that people... Um, use any pieces of advice that, that I offer to make up their own minds and mm. then decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And I, I genuinely believe there is no one right way. I genuinely mm. believe there is no one right way. And it's it's really then, you know, for us as individuals to take ownership of our own decisions and get the information that will help us to make the right decisions and then see where those decisions take us. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. I I would, I would echo that as well. I'm, I'm now intrigued by your comment about one day my job's going to end. What, <laughs> what would Roman do if, if he was not the product owner guy? What, 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 if you were not allowed to do anything to do with product management or Scrum ever again from tomorrow, what would you do? What would I do? Um, I think if it was right now, uh, I'd probably um, have too much energy um, just to to do what I enjoy otherwise um, you know playing a little bit of music and, and riding my bicycle um, I'd probably uh, either try and get involved in a, in a local business or in, in, in a charity and do some work there or possibly start up another business um, but I you know I do think it's it's important to care for our jobs and, and as I said I'm, I'm grateful for the job that I have I, I truly am. But I also think it's dangerous to completely identify with uh, a role that we play in a job that we have, because sooner or later that job is is going to change. And mm. I mean, who knows? You know, maybe somebody's listening to this, uh, you know, to this podcast and, and and thinking, oh my God, you know, Roman's really lost it now. I mean, he's talking a lot of crap, and you know, suddenly, you know, uh, you know, the reputation will be gone. It's tarnished. <laughs> we'll, we'll blame Paul for the edit. <laughs> Yeah, so, I should, you know, should have I mean, cut that out. Yeah, things things change. But you, ne you never had that sort of. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna set up a surf school on on the beach or something like that. I tried surfing many years ago, but I wasn't that good at it. And the trouble with water is it tends to be wet, and then here in the UK, <laughs> it tends to be chilly as well. Yeah, and then great. those surf suits. Oh man, they're, they're so tight. And the older I get, the tighter they become. I know there are quite a few you know all the blokes uh, out there and, and ladies who, who surf and surf really well but i think i just started it way too late um i don't know i mean why is that something that, that you aspire to <laughs> no i've got no sense i've got no sense of balance but um <laughs> no i don't you uh, have you can walk you can walk jeff yeah i, I, I do have I, I fall over now and again well, his knees did wait I've, 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 I've dislocated my knee playing darts roman so i, I don't think Surfing is my standing, uh, my standing still on an hockey playing darts, and you put you there. Yeah, I don't think surfing is my future, but uh, you've always been so. Yeah, you, you're a big skier, aren't you? I used to ski. Yes, yeah. I haven't skied for a number of years, though. So, uh, it's partly living in the UK and partly, uh, I guess, just having a family and 
and the, the, the effort and the hassle of, of dragging people then across half of Europe to some, some slopes. Yeah, yeah. It's not, 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 not a simple task, is it? Mm. Mm. What do you think the future of Agile is? What is the future of Agile? I don't know. <laughs> or product development, maybe. What's the future of product development? Um, so for me, a lot of the, the basic ideas of what I view as basic ideas in, in, in Agile, um, and, you know, in, in Agile frameworks and Agile approaches still hold true. I think we, we can all still benefit, you know, I think virtually all organizations can still benefit from more effective collaboration, um, and a more focus, uh, a stronger focus on, uh, users and customers and, and value creation. I mean, for product management, I really think that uh, empowerment is a, is a big issue and uh, establishing product roles in organizations where people have the skills and people have the decision-making authority. And then also the responsibility and accountability that comes with it in order to progress products and and, and run with their ideas. So I think that'd be, that'd be really cool to see. I certainly hope that say, you know, in 10, certainly 15, 20 years from now, that's not gonna be such a big issue. Um, I also hope that product people will will maybe continue to be or be even more strategic. So I, I always think it's kind of nice to take care of the product backlog and help uh, identify and write some epics and user stories. That's that's good stuff. Uh, but I think it's uh, even more important to understand and be clear on the strategy that you have in order to make or keep your product successful and maybe be able to set some goals on a product roadmap for the next six to 12 months to align everyone and give everyone an idea of where the product is going. So I hope that that's gonna, that's gonna continue. Cool. Not very good at predicting the future, I'm afraid, me. I'd like to think that startups you know if there's a startup that's 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 come out of this pandemic maybe somewhere in, in 20 years time if they, these startups are being led by um people that really under, uh, do understand that like you said that growth mindset that product ownership empowerment and and letting good people build good product build good products i don't think a lot of the um the difficulties product owners are having now will kind of ebb away maybe Maybe, maybe that's a false hope, but I'd like to think that maybe leadership is viewed very differently in 20, 20, 30 years time. That'd be nice, that'd be really nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. But then I guess just building on what you just said, Paul, um, I mean, it's called product management, right? But um, there's so much people stuff in there. I mean, exactly, yeah. People always get in the way, don't they? <laughs> that's the trouble. The trouble are the people. <laughs> if it was only code, if it was I only know, if it was technology. just robots. Maybe that's maybe it's AI. Maybe artificial intelligence will be defining what products we need and building them for us. And... That, that reminds me then of some Ian, Ian Banks novels, right? Where the, the big minds, the big massive computers decide yeah. what, what uh, the people should do across the yeah. galaxy or whatever it is. You know, it's gone in Skynet, isn't it, Jeff? Uh, Terminator 2, another film you haven't seen. But um, yeah, end with Skynet and the Terminator's taken over. Well, the that's that's Minority Report. No, no, wrong wrong <laughs> film. That's Tom Cruise. Wrong, wrong, wrong actor, wrong film, wrong decade. What was, what was the thing where they're sort of moving the screen across like that? That's Minority Report. Yeah, yeah, but what did they call that? What was the system? Oh, okay. I don't know what the system is. The another name. That wasn't, that wasn't Skynet. It's not okay. Skynet. No, that's, that's um, yeah, wrong film. <laughs> wrong, wrong genre. Fair enough. Right. Yeah, very good. All right. Okay. Message. Final message then, Raymond. What do you reckon? We, we've um, we'll we'll switch your what's your final message to our listeners? <laughs> My final message. Um, a love and peace. <laughs> <laughs> World peace. We that goes without saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think. I like what you said, Jeff, about um, being happy with things not being perfect. And so I, I think I think a common mistake we make um, is to put ourselves too much under pressure and to expect in a way in a way too much too quickly uh, from ourselves. And because we expect it of ourselves, we also expect it of the people who are around us, the people that we work with. And so something that I wish for for myself and for everyone is that we learn to um, uh, maybe 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 relax a little bit and uh, in the sense that we we understand that yeah we need to get stuff done and there are things that we'd like to do but you know some things just 
don't happen immediately and if it doesn't work out immediately either then that's not a not a problem it's not a not a big deal no big deal <laughs> no, no, big good. no big deal cool it was it was it was awesome mate. it would have been obviously so much better if we were meeting in person but it's been good to catch up with you thank you for taking the time joining us in our virtual pub well, thank you for having me. It was nice, no nice to chat with you, gentlemen. Right, You're absolutely. going to warm the car up. It's pretty chilly out. Get the, get the <laughs> seats on and we'll, uh, we'll meet you out the front. We'll meet you out the back. Of course. <laughs> Cheers, Roman. Great. Thanks, guys.